It's the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. Welcome to the Open Mic Broadcast Network. And we are in the SWAC football championship mode. And I am fortunate to have on the line with me none other than the head man himself of the FAMU Rattlers, Willie Shotgun Simmons. How you doing, my man? Man, <clears throat> I'm doing well, Mike. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you as well, my friend. And let me say congratulations uh, on almost the per- perfect storm, but the perfect storm in conference, and that's all that really matters, right? Yep, you read right about that. Yes, sir. Well, look, before we get into the, the X's and the O's, it almost seemed like from the opening kickoff, and I do mean the opening kickoff, 96-yard touchdown return in um, the, the game against Jackson State, do you look back and see that was the sign of a special season that's been thus far? Well, it would seem that way, um, but, but I think that the sign was how these guys came into training camp, you know, just being a focused, locked in group, understanding that we were very talented. You know, I've, told, I've said it many times, the most talented football team that I've had the opportunity to coach top to bottom, um, but we've been saying it since day one that talent's not enough. Uh, it, it takes commitment, sacrifice, you know, dedication, and, 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 and humility uh, to become the team that you're destined to be, and, and these guys have bought into that message and worked hard every day at it, and uh, I think that opening the kickoff all the way through this season has just been a combination of all the hard work they put in. Absolutely, and um, it's ironic. You know, you and I have gone back over times past where, you know, you're the quarterback whisperer, the offensive creative mind, but it's that dark cloud defense, man, that has really been uh, answering the call and uh, coming through in some critical times throughout the course of this year, man, how do you summarize your defensive play? Well, they're the best in the country statistically, you know, and uh, those guys, again, the everyday, just the, the mental approach that they bring to practice, to games, uh, it's really unprecedented. You know, I've been around a lot of great defensive teams in my day, but just the way these guys come to work every day, and, you know, they're always chasing something. And uh, we had a goal this year to be the number one defense in the country. And they knew in order to do that, you know, you had to stop the you had to stop the run, you had to eliminate big plays, you had to get people off the field on third downs, you had to find a way to be optimistic, and and they've done those things as well as anybody in the country, you know. So it starts with our middle linebacker, Isaiah Major, um, and our defensive line, you know, and then the secondary. The last half of the season, man, I mean, every game getting their hands on footballs. Uh, it, it's just been a fun year. It's been a special group to watch, and as the primary play caller on offense uh, and the head coach, it makes my job a lot easier when you know that you don't have to go out every week and try to, just, you know, scheme up 30-plus points because you know your defense is going to hold up. And that's been that's been a great uh, great feeling for me. Absolutely. Now, and you uh, talk about that defense has been Johnny on the spot. If I'm not mistaken, they're averaging almost a turnover a game somehow, some way. And that's unusual on any level, man, but it just lets you know how aware and aggressive these guys are on that defensive side of things. Well, it's just our mindset. You know, we, we value the ball. You know, we understand that the ball is the most important thing. So on offense, it's about possessing it, keeping it. On defense, it's about finding, finding you know, opportunities to take it away. And early in the year, you know, we weren't getting our hands on, on, a, on a lot of footballs, uh, particularly with interceptions. You know, we had some fumbles and some fumble recoveries, but interceptions, we weren't getting, getting a lot. And so about midseason, we really made a point of emphasis during the bye week to really challenge this team to, to really hone in on, on – Interceptions. You know, I think at that point in the season, we didn't have an interception. The cornerbacks didn't have an interception, you know, as a group after five games, I believe. And and, and then the end of the season, Eric Smith, you know, has three, you know, and uh, our safeties are starting to get their hands on balls. And so just to, just a commitment to practicing it the way that we practice it, you know, talking about it, making a point of emphasis on it. Uh, those guys are really bought into that, and, and it's manifested itself in, uh, into it being one of the most optimistic defenses in the country. We're talking right now with Coach Willie Simmons of the Family Rattlers, East Division Champions of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. They'll be hosting the Prairie View A&M University Panthers December 2nd. And uh, the stage is all set. Now, Coach, as we, we talk about, you say it all the time, uh, the guy who gets the, the most noise and the most blame in most cases is your quarterback play. And you've had an up and down uh, roller coaster of emotions dealing with your starting quarterback. How have you weathered him through the storm, through the good and the bad for this season? Well, we had a conversation when he first got here you know, two years ago, 
And and I told her, as a starting quarterback, one, you know, that, that you have to have broad shoulders. But when you add on the fact that you're the starting quarterback at Florida and m University, the place that's seen prolific quarterback play all the way back from Steve Scrubs to Ken Riley and, 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 and Albert Chester, on up to Quinn Gray, Tina Sampson, Jay Wan Sider, Pat Bonner, and even Ryan Stanley, even. Uh, the expectation is through the roof that you perform at the highest level. And when you don't, even when they don't, it's not even when you don't, it's when they perceive that you don't because, right, I mean, um, Jeremy's taking scrutiny this year, and he's been swag player of the week. <laughs> like, he was offensive player of the week, <laughs> and you would have thought right. he threw eight interceptions in a game. You know, he threw for 300 yards, three touchdowns, and, and took all types of criticism, saying he needs to be benched from our fan base. And so I just talked to him, and forced it for him, I played the position, played out of school, Clemson, that, you know, has the same type of expectations, and just told him, hey, that's the way it works. You know, it always goes head coach, play caller, quarterback. Well, I happen to be the head coach and the play caller, so I'm going to get them. And then the next guy is you. And so you got to be able to handle that that uh, that criticism, you know, handle the expectations. And he's done a great job of doing it, man. I mean, he's a mentally tough kid. I, I, I've enjoyed coaching him these last two years. And, uh, you know, hopefully we, I got two more with them. And uh, we, we're, we're a much better football team. Our chances to win increase tremendously with, with Jeremy Musa behind center. Right. Now, you just hit on something, Coach, that I want to touch on if we can. Uh, you've been the head coach and the play caller. Uh, some have proven that they can do it, and some have proven that it's overwhelming in some cases. What exactly is the, the secret sauce of being able to have that equal balance, and what are some of the things that people don't really see behind the scenes that leads to being the leader as far as the play caller and the head coach that can sometimes be a conflict of interest? Well, I, I've, I've never wanted to say that there's a one right way and one, or you know, there's, there's never one right way to do it. You know, what I found is that I'm only able to be successful as a head coach and a play caller when I, A, have great help around me, and B, don't try to micromanage. I don't think you can micromanage and, and be a great head coach and play caller. That That's a full responsibility in and of itself to try to run an entire program, but also be responsible for all the plays that go into a game. And so, you know, defensively, my, Ryan Smith, his title is head coach of the defense. He's not the defensive coordinator. He's the head coach of the defense. I rarely, if ever, address the defense, unless I'm talking to the entire team. But I won't call a, a defensive-only meeting. Now, I'll call an offensive-only meeting, but I won't call a defensive only meeting. The only time I really address the defense again is doing team meetings, uh, and then you know our Friday night meetings, you know when we at the hotel. And so Ryan Smith is in charge of managing that side of the ball. Doc Gamble is our special teams coordinator. You know I'm a little bit more involved in special teams just because I understand the the, the nuances of it. But defensively, I really don't touch very much of it. And then when it comes to the other areas, I, I, I try my best. Now, I oversee it, so I have, I have enough knowledge of what I want to see to know when it's not being done the way I want it to, but I'm not micromanaging those guys standing over their shoulders and, and, and you know, trying to tell them how to do their job. So you have to hire good people around you that you trust, that are self-motivated and self-driven to be great, and that allows me to focus on the part of the job that I have the most responsibility in, which is setting the temperament of the team, handling the media, fundraising, you know, and, and then just, again, just trying to make sure that, that we're putting our guys in the best possible positions on the field and off the field. And I think that's the key. And there are a lot of guys that try to do it, but if you try to do it and you, you're a micromanager, I just think it'll get overwhelming. You know, you can't serve two masters, right? Something's going to suffer. And when you're micromanaging everything, I think the play calling sometimes suffers. And, uh, and I think that's been, you know, I think you've seen that across the college landscape um, in, in some of those situations. Now, when did you learn in your head coaching career that this would have to be the best philosophy as far as you're concerned? Um, I, I think just as a play caller, once I became a play caller, I kind of took that approach then. Um, you, you know, <clears throat> I started out being a, a coordinator and a running back coach. So I had, a, I had a quarterback coach, a receiver coach, tight end, offensive line. Well, as an as a offensive coordinator, you, you are responsible for the entire product so you have to have enough knowledge of each position to be able to see where their problems and fix those problems, right? But I said right then, I'm not going to coach offensive line. I'm not going to coach wide receivers. I have to coach the running backs to make sure that they're sound in what they're doing 
and I will oversee the entire operation of the offense. So I just kind of took that philosophy myself back then, and it just it, it grew when I became a head coach. So the responsibilities grew, but my approach to it didn't. You know, I, I, I always said I wanted to be that coach that didn't. I'm just, it's not my leadership style. I'm not a micromanager. And so I, I really take great pride in trying to hire individuals, again, that embody those qualities and principles and traits that I need to be successful, which is, again, you got to be, you got to be a self-starter. If I got to tell you when to come to work, when to leave, how much film to watch, how to coach your position, uh, frankly, I don't need you. I, I need to get rid of you and find somebody that can. And, and I've been blessed to be around some phenomenal individuals throughout my years as a head football coach, you know, that, that understood that. Not all of them have. And that's why, you know, you see, I'm not with the same guys nine years later that, as I started with, you know, back in 2015. And so I, I just think that's the, you know, for me, like I said, I'm not saying that's the formula, that's my formula. And fortunately for me, I mean, it, it's led to a, a moderate level of success at this level. And um, until that success goes away, you know, we'll, we'll keep it that way. Absolutely. We're talking with Coach Willie Simmons of the Family Rattlers East Division Champions of the Southwestern Athletic Conference for 2023. Now, I have to ask this checks and balance question, Coach. Um, being on the FCS uh, budget, uh, the, the limited challenges and the obvious challenges that you have when it comes to finance, it's got to be very challenging to maintain an, um, a, a staff that is empowered to quote unquote do their job and be able to pay them what's fair, and then in some cases, and I'm speaking on that LCS level, the head coaches sometimes might have to take a sacrifice in their salary just to kind of spread the love around to keep the guys somewhat satisfied. Do you see yourself in that situation? Well, obviously, like you said, it's really difficult to retain quality coaches uh, when you've had the level of success that we've had um, naturally. Uh, people are watching. Everyone's trying to find that diamond in the rough. I mean, we've had a top 10 defense the last three years. It, it, it's, it's amazing to me that Ryan Smith is still here. You know, now maybe because 2021 was his first year as a play caller, we finished fifth nationally in defense. Last year, we finished 10th. And now this year, his third year as a play caller with number one national total defense. So, I mean, I, and I, mean, I ain't, I'm, I'm saying that as a head coach, I don't want to lose him. But someone would be crazy <laughs> from a high level to not come and, and, and talk to Ryan Smith about running their defense. I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding. You know, Marquise Bell, 2021, uh, left. He's with the Dallas Cowboys, you know, starting with the Dallas Cowboys. Had a phenomenal, he's having, he's having a phenomenal year. Well, he's gone. Well, in the next year, we finished 10th in the nation. Well, Isaiah Land, the Buck Buchanan Award winner. You know, Kamara Stevens, uh, a first-team all-conference defensive end. They both leave. Well, all we do is come back the next year and finish first. So he's showing that we can play at a high level, even while losing phenomenal football players. And so the challenge is, yes, how do we, how do we pay him a salary that's compensatory with the other coordinators in, in the FCS landscape? Because he's not the highest paid coordinator. He's not even the highest paid coordinator in the conference. I mean, they're guys that make a lot more money than, than Ryan Smith makes. You know, I'm not going to call any names or any schools, but aren't having nearly the level of success that he's having. And so that's the challenge that I have and that I pose to my, uh, my administration and my alumni base to say, hey, fair is fair, right? In this country, we, we, we talk about capitalism and you, you, you make what you earn, what, you, what you're worth. He's worth more than the salary that he's making. You know, there are people that will say I'm worth more than the salary that I'm making, but I can't do my job effectively without Ryan Smith. So before I go in and ask for a raise to make me one of the highest paid coaches in the conference, I need to make sure that Ryan Smith is happy because if he's going home every night and his wife is saying, hey, you're doing all this and they're still not paying you, we have a problem. Same thing with our D-line coach. I mean, we've had one of the best defensive lines in FCS football over the last three years. You know, Buck Buchanan Award winner. We finished nationally top five in sacks the last three years. We're leading the nation in tackles for loss this year. He's not the highest paid defensive line coach in the conference. And so how do we make our salaries competitive to where, A, we don't lose our guys and they, they – Many of my coaches got poached by schools within our conference who offered them a lot more money than we are, than we pay them. Thankfully, not to say they were loyal, but I think they saw what we had coming back and they knew that this was, was going to be a special season, so they turned those opportunities down. But I can't keep assuming that that's going to happen because at some point the money wins out. I mean, we, we call a spade a spade, but the money eventually wins out. And so that's a, that's a huge challenge for us. 
And if we want to remain competitive, and that's why I tell our alumni base, if we want to remain competitive and be a perennial power at this level, we have to find a way to make our salaries uh, compensatory with everyone else in the conference or in, 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 in the uh, FCS landscape. We have to find a way to continue to, to, to find and build new positions to make sure that, that you're not overworking them because you can, you can pay them. And I think that's one of the challenges at, at many low resource institutions. Well, in order to pay people more, they cut positions underneath them. So you make the money, but you got to do extra work. And so now it's that conundrum, you know, that, that, yeah, they're making more money, but you're burning them out. And so we got to find a way to do that. And if we can, which I think we can, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to sustain the success that we're having, but it's definitely a challenge to, to, to retain quality coaches these days. No doubt about it, and as they say, the the hand is is faster than the eye, the sleight of hand. So you can try to finagle this as best as you can, but eventually, the money is going to be the bottom line. And uh, going back to your uh, your field of play, you've been operating running back by committee. You got three dynamic backs, and uh, if you could, uh, what each one of those guys are bringing to the table and you know as I would say yin and yang but then we need another uh, term for the third one so I just let you go into detail on how dynamic each one of these guys are and what they bring uniquely to the table no no question about it you know we have a nice little three-headed monster you know in the backfield um, all with different skill sets well you know it starts with Terrell Jennings uh, he's the elder statesman of the group you know, in his fifth year and uh, you know Terrell's uh, uh, you know 225. You know he, he got the step to speed. I mean he's broke a 70 yard touchdown run this year, a couple of 40 yard touchdown runs this year. So he breaks out in the open field. Uh, you're not catching big fella, you know, but he, he runs downhill, uh, catches the ball fairly well out of the backfield, you know, and has the most experience, you know. So I think he's the guy that gives us in crunch time situations. You know, you kind of say, okay, let's go to the guy that's got the experience. That's Terrell Jennings. Uh, then you look at you know Kevin Dean. Uh, you know, Kevin's kind of your slasher. You know, he's a more dynamic guy, um, can make you miss in open field, um, has really good hands, you know, scored a 47 yard touchdown uh, reception versus South Florida. You know, has made some plays out of the backfield for us on screens and things of that nature. And so he gives you that element of that guy that can play in space uh, that you can move around and do a lot of things with. And then Jock West, against the bruiser. You know, he's a 6'2, 245 pound, big physical back. That's your short yardage goal line guy that uh, really, really, no one wants to tackle consistently. You know, you got that much mass coming at you, uh, full speed, you know, with a mouthful of gold teeth. Uh, nobody nobody wants to get in front of that. So uh, they're, they're very complimentary of each other. And I tell you what, man, Leland Wilhoyt has been a pleasant surprise the last uh, half of the season. You know, he's, he's really your most dynamic guy. Uh, Leland's played some wide receiver for us. He's kind of bounced back and forth between wide receiver and running back. But he's your, he's your speed guy. Uh, he's your he's your hybrid, you know, who got you want to get on the perimeter. And so we say three headed because all those guys have over four hundred yards, so three hundred and four hundred yards rushing this year. Leland's kinda of bringing it up the rear, uh, but he has been dynamic as well as of late. So we're we're really, really, you know, blessed to have a, a, a deep backfield. You know, running the ball was a commitment for us coming into the season. We were dead last in the conference in rushing last year. Really wanted to make a commitment to improving that this year. Right now we're middle of the pack, but it was it, second in average yards per carry. So I don't look at the yards per se. I look at average yards per attempt, and we're right around five yards per attempt, which is where you want to be. And so very, very pleased with how we run the ball this year, and, and obviously we'll need to continue to do so uh, to be, you know, the team that we're capable of being. We know we have a dynamic quarterback, a, a prolific passing attack, but if you can c- complement it by being able to run the ball effectively, uh, that makes you pretty indefensible. Yes, sir. Now, it's no doubt as we can head toward the game, of, of magnitude, December 2nd, you'll be hosting the Panthers. Um, last time you met, of course, was on your homecoming. You and I talked about that prior to. And you, you, uh, let's just say um, they still kind of sweeping up a little Panther pool off the stadium. <laughs> you know, 45-7 was the score. Well, it is what it is. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I know I'm doing a, a bias interview, not a, a non-bias interview right now, but. I'm a Panther fan, there's no doubt about that, but it is what it is. Now, with that being said, we know it's difficult to beat a team twice in the same year. Uh, And then in the manner in which you handled the game, have you had to rein in your squad, hey, guys, let's not get hoodwinked, you know, from October 28th 
This is a totally different situation, totally different team, and hopefully a team that has learned quite a deal from that 45-7 last meeting. Uh, you know, obviously, that's the number one question that I've been asked um, ever since we knew that we were playing Prairie in the championship game. And I'll say this about this football team. Um, you know, I try to deliver a message to them daily to where I don't have to switch it week to week. And, and what I mean by that, you know, obviously, giving Sunday speeches, you know, sky reports, giving pregame speeches, you know, it, it, it's like a pastor. Obviously, you're a pastor, so you understand how that message, you got to be prepared every week. Okay, what can I give them today that's going to get them, get them riled up and get them, get them going? <laughs> and after a while, it gets mundane and you try to, but I think just like pastoring, and I hope I don't lose my audience with this, but just like pastoring, if the, if the number one message is consistent, then you can spin it however many ways you want, but it stays to the true premise. If you're a Christian, the number one premise is Jesus Christ. So no matter how many different messages you can bring and how many scriptures you read, it all centers back to that same point of living a life for Jesus, right? Well, coaching for me is the same thing. So for us, well, our holy grail is our process. And, and again, I know people have heard that phrase and it's catchy and cliched and everybody has a different way of saying it. But for us, that's what it's about. It's about our, just like our, my, my spiritual walk is about my daily walk to try to be perfect and chase perfection, which is Jesus is the only man that was perfect. And if, if you choose to believe that, well, in football, it's the same thing. We're chasing perfection every single day. So it's not about the situation. It's not about the moment. It's not about anything other than chasing perfection. And if we chase perfection, we'll hit excellence somewhere along the way. When it's time to perform, we will hit excellence. And so for us, that's been our message since day one. We're not looking at rivalry games. We're not looking at the, the, the homecoming game, the Florida Classic, the SWAT Championship, the, the Celebration Bowl. We're chasing perfection. That's what we're doing. And so how do you, you know, get, lock a team in that beat a team 45 to 7 three weeks ago? Well, chase perfection. Because even in that 45 to 7 win, were we perfect? No. We turned the ball over. They scored. You know, we didn't grade out 100%. And so we still have to work every single day to chase perfection. And as a football team, that process is what drives us every single day. Uh, one of my good buddies who I coached in the past, Jeremy Kellum, spoke to the team before the Alabama A&M game. We'd already clinched the East. You know, that game really had no meaning. And, um, he, he, you know, he used the analogy of, of, a, of a, a horse, training a horse. You know, back in your day, you know, because you're a lot more seasoned than I am, back in your day, you, know, you, 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 beat, you whip the horse. You whip the horse to get the horse to do what you, need, what you wanted it to do. Well, Eventually, my generation came along because we're a lot nicer than y'all, and you know we don't have to beat everybody. We figured <laughs> that <laughs> we figured, hey, horses really like carrots, and so if you if you steal horse training now, they dangle a little carrot in front of the horse's face, and when the horse does what the trainer asks it to do, it is rewarded with a carrot. So y'all, yeah, you get that horse to do a lot more for you now because it wants that new carrot. <laughs> So he used that analogy with our football team of, now, we've eaten the carrot of beating Jackson. We, we ate the carrot of, you know, winning the, winning the, winning the Eastern Division. What's our new carrot? And, and so for us, it's about continuing to chase that next goal, that next prize, but doing so all understanding that that process is important. And so those little analogies kind of drive the message home. But for us, it's about the same thing. We, gotta, we have to chase perfection every day, be where our feet are, our preparation today is the most important thing that's in front of us, not championship games. Our preparation today, our guys, are, 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 they got time off. We didn't practice yesterday. We're not practicing today. What are you doing today that's going to give yourself a chance to be successful on Saturday? If you just sit around the house and eat third, seconds and thirds and fourth servings and, and, and don't watch film, don't go out there and get a jog in, don't do anything, you're probably not chasing perfection. And so for us, it's about what we can do daily to get ourselves to that point, to, to be our very best. And uh, that's, that's how we keep ourselves locked in and motivated. Very well stated from a youngster talking to an old head, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> look, you, look, you said something a few weeks ago back on the uh, uh, conference, teleconference or the Zoom call, however they call it these days. You know, when you get old, you get, you know, selective on what you can remember. But anyway, uh, you said something that, kind of slid under the radar and you emphasize it with yeah I said it and back 
as you say, in my day, would have been prime uh, bulletin board material. I don't know if you recall what you said, but I'm going to remind you anyway. You know that's what I do. <laughs> uh, after you had played Southern, it was a very contested game, and you said, um, I'm sure we're going to see them in the championship game. Then you backed it up with, yeah, I said it. I went there, I said it. You recall saying that? I mean, probably if you if you if you don't like it, you're saying it in clear. I said it. So. <laughs> uh, uh, now look, do I need to go pull the tapes? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I look. I, I trust you. So I'm gonna believe that if, if you said that, I said yeah. it. Then I'm sure it's somewhere in the archives. So yeah, I, I must have said it after that game. Yes, sir. But but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, you you have a quality squad from top to bottom. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you've had um, a good breaks because, you know, there's a thing. People say, oh, they just got lucky this game. And I, I think I may have shared this analogy with you time after time. You know, luck is spelled L-U-C-K. And, and, and there's no such thing as being lucky when you understand what luck really means. And that means laboring under correct knowledge. And it's not lucky that my guys were in position and were on their assignments and they stayed in their lanes to blow up your play. It wasn't lucky that the guys opened up uh, lanes on the first kick for 96 yards for a touchdown. But you can call me lucky all you want, but I can't be that lucky. I got to be doing something right. So with that, I tip my hat to you. But And, and, and I do wish you luck. You know I mean you well. But you, you, you know come December 2nd, I'm going to be leaning just slightly in one direction. And, and as they say in Hall of Nights, the, 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 don't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> yes sir but you know when, when you if you had to summarize your season thus far in I won't say a word yeah let me let me I'm gonna put you to a word you're a smart dude how would you summarize your season thus far in one word um I want to summarize our season in one word. I didn't stub them, folks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I hate to use the word destiny because, again, that just implies so much. But but I just, I, I believe it's destiny. You know, I, I just think everything that we put in, um, and, and, and Rattlers understand, this time last year, we were turning our shoulder pads we were making plans to hit the road recruiting. You know, we were trying to figure out how we were going to move forward because we were so devastated that we didn't get the, the at-large playoff bid. And when I met with the team this, this past Sunday, a year ago, it was the second most challenging meeting that I've ever had. The most challenging one was when I met with the Prairie View team in 2015 and told them I was taking a job at FAMU. That was the hardest meeting I've ever had to have with my football team. But that meeting last okay. year was the second most challenging one because I saw how hard we worked. I know how committed those guys were, you know, guys like Isaiah Smith and Isaiah Land and all those guys. But I saw a look on their eyes, on the guys that were returning, I saw a look in their eyes that I said, I can't wait to get back on the field with this group. And so the moment we reported in training camp, I reminded them of that day because there were some new guys. There were about 30 new guys on the team that, that weren't in that team meeting. And I had to remind them, or I had to fill them in on the last time we got together as a football team, this was the meeting that we had. And right then I knew that we were destined to be at this place. Because I said, never again this season will we allow someone else to control our own destiny. And just the way we work, the way that, that, that everyone is bought in, the way that we've fought through adversity, I mean, from the rap video to major injuries to you name it, you know, we, we, we overcome adversity. And that's because our guys have kept their eyes set on the, the path ahead of us and not looking at our rearview mirror, not, you know, looking around, keeping our eyes focused. And it's just, like I say, I say it's destiny. Like I say, it's not luck. It's, it's not anything like that. It's just this team was destined to be in this moment because of how they prepared throughout. I mean, we had the best single-year APR score that we've had here in, in, in forever. But it's the overall commitment to excellence in everything these guys do that, that has gotten us to this point. So that's what I'm saying. If I had to sum it up in one word, I, I, I just say destiny. This team is destined to, to do something that hasn't been done around here in a very, very long time. 
Well, that sounds very appropriate, sir, with everything that has been going on. Now, you know, throughout the course of this interview, you know, part of my job is just to give you a hard time because uh, people that may may not be aware, uh, we have a kinship. Um, I, I, I recorded and broadcast his first uh, head coaching game at Texas Southern, and uh, it was a blessing and honor to be a part of it and to watch it grow as a man, a leader, and a coach. Um, not only on the field but off the field. And just to see the growth is just amazing. And I can accept the fact that I have gotten a little bit older. And so I, I do wish you some luck and well. But, you know, don't, you, if I'm going to have to do a Woody Allen and come out there and, and, and tackle one of them family rattlers <laughs> to keep from scoring <laughs> on the Panthers. You know, when I talk, I've thought about that when you talk about this rival week that's coming up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Woody went for two against Michigan. And they said, well, why did you go for two and you already had the blowout lead? And he said, because I couldn't go for three. Y'all old two cats are ruthless back then, man. We got a little bit more to call over these days. Well, well, you know, while you was giving that carrot analogy, I'm not going to lie to you. You know what came to my head? I said, yeah. That's soft. That's what that turns out to be soft. But I'm not going. I'm not going to go there, man. Look, it's not my my day is past me. Uh, but I enjoy watching you youngsters uh, uh, do your thing, man. Uh, the technology of uh, the game has advanced so far. Um, but but one thing I will say, and you might agree to disagree with this, um, we have got so finesse inside the red zone that it's kind of ridiculous. I've never seen from the NFL down to Pee Wee people lining up in the shotgun or a pistol inside the five-yard line on third and one, fourth and one. That's ridiculous, man. But I'm not going to kill it. I'm not going to kill it because I keep coming back <laughs> to your that's, fan that's base. The next, that's, that's the next show. When we get on again, we'll talk yeah. football and, and we'll, go over the, <laughs> we'll go over the X and O's and thought process behind a lot of those decisions. So this is this, this the interview for us today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, with that, my man, I do appreciate you. I want to give you some closing thoughts and comments as we wrap up for today, man. Well, no, as always, it's an honor. And you mentioned, you know, I, I, my first game there, and it seems like yesterday, man, taking the field against Texas Southern, you know, getting the introduction of the head coach there at Prairie View. And, uh, and, and our relationship has been just amazing, you know, over these last nine years, and I, and I truly honor it, and I truly appreciate it, you know, but – Again, that that same can be said for Bubba McDowell. You know, I have the utmost respect for Bubba. Right. And um, you know, he, he he did his time. You know, he's been the interim a few times, and uh, you know, he's been loyal to Prairie View. And, and you know, and I and I hope that the fans there in the administration appreciate that about Bubba. And uh, and, and we're in a changing landscape. You know, you talk about the the you know how our generation has changed, but. I think everyone has changed, evolved to the point now where, you know, I don't, I don't recall back in quote unquote the old days, HBCUs terminating coaches before the contracts were up. You know, I, I remember, I, I know about non-renewals. You know, when, when the contracts up, we're not going to re- we're not going to renew it for the next season. We're going to go in another direction. You know, I remember those days, but to see coaches getting fired in their second year, like. I, I, I just, we got to be real careful of the direction we're going and the message that we're sending. You know, uh, we, we and, I, and I may get take a bunch of criticism from this, and I'm, I'm okay, I have broad shoulders. We can't operate, when I say we, I mean HBCUs collectively. We can't operate like Power 5 schools operate. The Texas A&Ms of the world, the Michigan States, the, the, those schools, they can afford to pay a coach $20 million, $30 million, $75 million to not coach football there before the contract expires. You know why? Because, they, because their players have everything they need already. Jimbo Fisher, Mel Tucker, those guys that have been terminated aren't going out to their alumni begging for nutrition. They're not begging for, you know, an, uh, weight room equipment. or they're not, they're not begging their alumni for those things. They're trying to keep up with the Joneses, maybe. They're trying to get bigger NIL deals, maybe. But they're not, they're not asking for bare essentials. We, as HBCUs, are going out to raise money every day to balance our budget, to, to say, hey, if we, if, if we don't raise money, we're going to be in a deficit, which means we can't even pay our bills. 
We can't pay hotels to stay there. We can't pay food vendors to feed us. We can't pay bus companies and airlines to transport us. We can't pay apparel companies to outfit us if, you, if we don't just do the bare minimum. And so we're making decisions to terminate coaches and possibly buy out their contracts. And we still have stuff that the players need. I, I just think that's a <laughs> that's a crazy proposition to me. I mean, it, it really is. And again, I, I get it. I understand administrators have a very, very tough job. That's the part of leadership is to make those tough decisions. You know, but I just think we got to be careful as alumni base, as a fan base, as, as people who do support our athletic programs. That I, I don't think we're at that space yet. You know, not saying we can't get there, but I don't think we're in the space where we can afford to buy a coach out of their contract. Like, in two years, and again, and, and, and I'm speaking of one situation in, in, in particular, but as a whole, in general, like, I, I just don't think that we're in a position to do that because that money, imagine what that money could be used for on, as far as, you know, giving the student athletes what they need to be successful. Most of our schools don't give cost of attendance stipends, which means we're, we're, it's hard for us to compete with other FCS programs, with mid-major programs, to recruit when we don't even give cost of attendance. I'm not even talking about NIL. I'm talking about a cost of attendance stipend, which for those that don't understand what that means, is a scholarship covers tuition, room and board, fees, and course-related books. It's all a, a full scholarship covers. Well, each school in America has a separate breakdown that's considered actual cost of attendance. Because as we all know, everyone who went to college, college is a lot more than just tuition, food, <laughs> books, and, and student fees, right? You gotta, you gotta wash your car, you gotta put gas in your car, you gotta entertain your, your significant others, you gotta travel home during Thanksgiving and Christmas and all those other times. So what schools do is they calculate that into their actual cost of attendance. So about 10 years ago, the NCAA came in and said, okay, you athletic programs can provide that difference in a monthly stipend. And so you have student athletes that receive upwards to a thousand, sometimes fifteen hundred dollars, depending on where you are, extra a month over their scholarship, over their final over their Pell Grant, over their scholarships, they receive those stipends because they're covering that balance of cost of attendance. Most most of us don't can't provide that because that hasn't come from the athletic budget. So if we're not providing that how can we compete against schools that are? We're already not giving many NIL deals. We're not giving cost of attendance. So there's still things that we need, but we're going to fire a coach early and pay him a couple hundred thousand dollars, him or her, a couple hundred thousand dollars to not coach there. Like, I, I just don't see <laughs> how that equates to, you know what I mean? And, and again, I, I, I know it's controversial, and, 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 and I don't know the circumstances around firing, the hires, and all those things, so I may be speaking completely out of turn. But again, I'm using one example to speak to a larger uh, trend that I'm seeing in, 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 at our level is that the, 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 the desire for our fan base to win right now, to, to, to be competitive right now, is so great that we're not, we're not interested in process anymore. Like what happened to, you know, it takes three years to build a program. You gotta get, you gotta get the players out of the system that you didn't recruit that the past staff recruited to their scheme, to their liking, you got to get those guys out of the program. You got to recruit your players and then develop them to be what you want them to be. Like that typically takes <laughs> about three years before you see a change. Imagine if Florida State had soured on Mike Norvell after year two. They wouldn't be sitting here undefeated right now in year three. And so, again, I think we just got to be careful about not giving coaches a chance. If you give them everything they need, hey, at that point – that's why and I know I'm getting long-winded, but I'll say this not in. That's why I love Ashley Robinson so much. When Ashley Robinson hired me as the head coach at Prairie View A&M, and we had our head coaches meetings, just the head coaches and the athletic director, he said to us specifically year one, year two, I am not in here talking to anybody about championships because nobody has everything they need. There are certain coaches that are still part-time. There are certain coaches, uh, certain programs that don't have full staffs. There's certain programs that aren't fully funded scholarship-wise. So I'm not going to sit here and talk to you guys about winning championships when you don't have everything you need. Well, Ashley Robinson went out, raised some money, got the budget where it needed to be. That third year, it was a different head coach's meeting. He said, okay, everybody in this room now is full-time. 
Nobody's part-time. Everybody here has a full-time staff. Everybody here has a full allotment of scholarships. Now I expect championships. And I respected that because he said, I'm not going to ask you guys to go out there and make a miracle when you don't have everything you need. That last year said, now you have everything you need. Now I expect to see some different results. And I think that's the way we as fans need to look at it. Until these sports have everything they need, you can't really expect them to go out there and beat a fam you. And we don't have everything we need. But we've done a great job to beat a fam you, to beat a, a North Carolina Central, to beat programs that have reached a certain level. You can't really expect some of these programs to compete perennially with us if we don't have everything that we need. So, again, I know I get long-winded and get on my soapbox, but, but, but my heart pulls out to the coaches at any level, not just football coaches, but other sports as well, that, you know, have their jobs taken from them, not for insubordination, not for doing something wrong off the field, but just for wins and losses when they don't have all the resources they need to be able to compete at the highest level. So, again, I don't know who that message is for, but that, that's just kind of my part in words. For, you know, and that, that, that was weighing heavy on my heart during this, this Thanksgiving holiday season. Well, sir, it is duly noted, and I'm pretty uh, well uh, informed that it's going to be well received one way or the other. But, you know, you just set us up for one heck of a, a postseason gathering. And so you tell your your fam, you fans, and supporters that yeah, you're going to meet with the old relic again in the off season, <laughs> and we'll put the can down the road, and we'll go back and forth. But I do want to tell you, man, uh, I am proud of you. I love you like a little brother, and I am wishing you well to a degree. But you know, it's nothing personal. It's just the the spirit and camaraderie of uh, co- competition, and uh, we we do wish you so much success. I want to thank you for making time with us on this holiday weekend. And I know the family is important, and they pull it and gathering at you. You spent some time with old man today, and I truly appreciate it. He is Coach Willie Simmons, shotgun Willie Simmons. So the family Rattlers hosting the Prairie View a University Panthers December 2nd, and that's 3 p.m. your time, right? Or is that 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central. Okay, 3 p.m. Central time. And, of course, the Open Mic Broadcast Network will be there in full effect to help record some history one way or the other. It's going to be the Rattlers or it's going to be the Panthers. But somebody from the SWAC is going to take on the Howard Bison. And we'll talk about that later on. But for right now, my time is far spent, and I must exit stage left. Do follow me on X at the Mike Prince Show. Subscribe to the YouTube channel at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. And until the next time. You guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.